Hey Rachel, it's uh, me, Michael, over here. Um, from one lab to essentially another another lab, hoping to do a little debriefing with you now that you're at the finale of three and a half to four years of, of incredible work at Upwell. If you're up for a chat. Sure thing. Ask me all the hard questions. All right, here you go. Thanks. Um, you are just now wrapping up up well, and it seems like the state of play is probably quite different from when you first embarked on this adventure almost four years ago. It sure is, um, and this is uh, day four in the countdown to um, up well shuttering. Um, we're almost there, it seems really close, um, and it's been really neat to look back and think about um, what I and what we imagined was possible um, back in 2011, which seems like a million years ago. Um, so it's, it's neat to see um, what I imagined was possible then, um, what we were actually able to accomplish, um, and where I think things are going from here. So it's neat to check in with you. Well, maybe we can start off from the beginning. What was the, the big moonshot vision for, for Upwell initially? Sure thing. Um, it's definitely deeply rooted in and strongly inspired um, by three things. Um, so the first thing was a conversation between um, Ted Waite of the Waite Foundation, amazing philanthropist, um, and Vicki Spruill. At that time, she was the head of Ocean Conservancy. She's now the head mm -hmm. of um, the Council on Foundations. And they had a vision together of a war room for the ocean um, to be able to do rapid response campaigning um, because lots of things come up about the ocean all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots and lots of um, campaigns, obviously, about ocean conservation, but um, she wanted, um, Vicky had this vision that the, the brand of the ocean needed managed um, overall. So that was one of the strong inspirations. Um, another one was the work that I did just before this with TechSoup Global and their global network of partners, um, trying to figure out how to resource a bunch of individual partner organizations um, to all do capacity building work that was strongly localized um, and kind of figuring out the, the dynamic of um, one organization trying to support, support many par partner organizations and some difficult communications work. Um, and then the third thing was my frustration of working in campaigning with nonprofits and issues for a long time. It feels like we have such an opportunity, um, and so many resources around us to really get our messages out um, but we often restrict ourselves to just our email list, um, just our staff, um, and it can feel very constraining. So I wanted to experiment with what if we thought of resources for campaigning in a really different way? What if, we, what if our budget was the entire internet for a campaign? So I, I really want to dig into a bunch of those things, but I'm curious, just at the highest level, what do you feel like you and your team were able to accomplish over, over these past few years based on what you set out to do? Sure. Um, we had some pretty complex approaches and there are lots and lots of outcomes. Um, a couple of the ones that are, feel really exciting to me is that I feel like we were able to help hold a mirror up um, to what I think of as Team Ocean so that the, the movement um, could see itself, could see um, all of the diverse voices that are participating in it um, and could begin to see places where their campaigns overlap, where they're helping out each other, um, and to, to build some of the re resiliency and redundancy that I think is possible um, with network-driven campaigns when a movement can really see itself um, and do that kind of in the moment rather than looking back like, here's what we did last year. We can look back and see, here's what we did yesterday, here's what we did last week, um, and have some metrics attached to that mm -hmm. um, and, and strategize from those kind of ongoing inputs. So just uh, jumping into the that metrics piece of it, I feel like that's that's one of the conversations we're constantly finding ourselves in here at the Mobilization Lab, but I know all kinds of digital campaigners are always having that conversation around, you know, what what should we be measuring with social media? And it seems like you were doing some of your measures were different than a lot of what I see. And a lot of what I see is social for the purpose of lead conversion. Mm -hmm. And so where, where do you feel like you can make the strongest arguments for where, um, and I know some of this might be a leading question, but you know, like, wh what, are, like, what do you feel like you are most solid on in terms of where, um, 
you know, influencing conversations or some of the other work you've been, you've been doing has had an impact? Sure. Um, I think in terms of metrics, um, the reality of working in the nonprofit sector right now is that individual fundraising is really important for lots of organizations. And we know that those, um, those lists age out, um, mm-hmm. those lists get exhausted. We know about a bunch of the dynamics of um, digital fundraising and digital communications and nonprofits. Um, and so I'm definitely not trying to make those metrics go away. I think that's part of the reality of working in nonprofit communications now is that we're working on list conversions and all these optimizations yeah. and A-B testing to make all of that happen. Um, and so my fondest hope is that we can layer in one more layer of metrics um, so that we can keep all those things that are kind of sometimes described as vanity metrics, um, the normal set of campaign metrics. Did How many follows, followers did you get? How many people clicked on that link? Um, what was the average donation, how many new list signups, all that usual stuff, and also add in um, a metric, did we spike the conversation? Um, and are, is our team overall campaign mm-hmm. to campaign, um, it, are they spiking the conversation? Are we driving attention for this issue up? Um, and when I say spiking the conversation, what I mean is um, if you look at the total volume of online mentions, of social mentions for um, your issue, say if you're working on ocean acidification, which is one of ours, um, is it going up over time? Um, is there just kind of a, a low amount that's constant there? When the conversation takes a big spike in volume up, why yep. does that happen? Who does it? Um, and I think uh, adding in the kind of, I think of it as lifting up your head from just your own metrics to look at the, la- the larger landscape. Um, I think when we can layer that in, um, and we can encourage more organizations, more campaigners to layer it in. Um, it'll just make us way stronger. So I just want to try and I might want to try and challenge that a bit. I, I work with a lot of campaigners who, on the one hand, would say building awareness for an issue is critical groundwork, and I also work with and have met plenty of campaigners who will say um, that's not a critical part of our theory of change. In fact, we you know, there's certain, the, the way we're going to make change on an issue is reaching a certain target and influencing them specifically, not broad-based public education. So mm-hmm. what's your experience with oceans or any of the other issues you've worked on where it actually has mattered to change the direction of a conversation or, or having built public awareness, something that broad, as a useful goal? Sure. Really good question. Um, so... Uh, at the risk of sounding horribly crass, I don't care about awareness. Um, what I care about is attention. Um, and okay. attention to me is, is a measurable thing. Um, how uh, It's tricky to measure, but one of the ways that I think it's possible to measure attention um, is through measuring social mentions. Um, a social mention being like a tweet or a, a Facebook post that um, talks about your issue. So the reason that there's a, a difference to me between um, awareness, attention, and then those kind of lovely concrete campaign outcomes that you're talking about that people are pushing towards. Um, I think that concrete campaign outcomes, like we got this law passed, um, we got, changed this corporate policy are super important. Um, I also think that those are um, a collection of many tactical skirmishes that are impactful. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that lots of organizations do a good job of um, going after the ones that are actually achievable and have high impact. Um, I think those are real and we should keep them. Um, so it's kind of a spectrum to me. These like very concrete things. Um, awareness for me is about um, if you talk to the average person on the street, um, are they aware that this issue exists? Are they concerned about it? Um, and that to me is so soft um, that it's useful in some ways, but I'm much more attracted to the metric of attention because I feel like when you can see how much people are talking about um, your issue in online posts, how much they're associating their um, brand identity, their personal brand or their um, organizational brand with it, they're taking a little risk of their social capital. And I think that um, when people are spending a little bit Mm -hmm. of their social capital to talk about a controversial issue, um, that's a valuable thing. So um, to me, the difference in... Um, should we have these really concrete campaign outcomes like um, uh, getting a law passed versus should we be building attention is a question of time frames. So most of, we're really focused in to work on things like are we having enough campaign victories this year, this month? 
um, are, are we keeping our audiences engaged? Um, lots of times foundation um, grant cycles are really tightly tied into um, those kind of shorter term, six months, one year. Um, you need to prove that you're having approximately business success with those um, funds that they're investing in change. So um, I think those are shorter term, even multi-year mm -hmm. things. I think changes in the volume of attention um, help to indicate if something is is visible in um, in national and international conversations. Um, is this part of our national narrative of what we're working on together as humans? Um, for example, is it going to show up in the 2016 presidential election? Um, and when we uh, shifts in attention have a longer time frame because I think ultimately the work that we did at Upwell was about trying to change the story we tell ourselves about the ocean. So mm -hmm. it's not about a, a policy when we're going to have really soon because <laughs> okay. these kinds of deep human narrative shifts happen over a long time. Um, but we can see more attention to the narratives um, that are based in science, that are based in our current understanding of the ocean this year, this week. Um, so it's a, it's a way to have a metric for a thing that's otherwise, I think, really tricky to imagine or see if you're making any progress on. Let me ask you one uh, very detailed question on listening, a very tactical question. The, I feel like the, um, maybe a piece of listening that is most often um, pitched or marketed by some of the, you know, the, the firms we've been referring to or technology providers we've been referring to is, is the idea of uh, influencer tracking or um, influencer monitoring and engagement. And I'm wondering, you know, what when you've looked at conversations that have moved or um, in the in the listening work that you've done, what role does you know? How do you think about influencers? What role does that play? And I'm asking in part because I feel like that is one thing that organizations can do now that with with simple tools, right? Finding totally. who are, you know without having advanced analytical systems, you can using your topsy or even the basic Twitter stuff. You can see you know some of the people who are, who are even just talking a lot about your campaign or your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I've come to think of influencers who are talking about your issue as some of your biggest donors. I think yeah. they need your, like, like okay. your yeah. big individual donor, donor level of good treatment. Like, treat them like that. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, give them insider information. Mm -hmm. uh, Call make them sure, up. Yeah, get their opinions. Those are the people who are helping shape the story that's told by and told about your organization and your mm. mission. Um, and they, <laughs> they're called influencers. They're very well named, those influencers. Um, my, my practice around that is super um, kind of very practical and it comes out of my old community organizing work. Um, yeah. And like face-to-face -face community organizing. And I think of it okay. as when coming into a, a new community, um, a new movement, it's very normal to draw out on big paper with lots of post-its um, a power map. Like that's a, a, a principle of community mm -hmm. organizing. Um, and so we do that when, uh, with conversations at Upwell, um, but with, uh, when we draw power maps, there's a bunch of data coming into it. It's not just built on conversations with people about who, um, who are the power centers in the narrative um, but we can augment that with who's tweeting the most, who's Facebooking the most, like who blogs every once in a while, but then everybody um, will amplify that mm. in other social places. So um, understanding the kind of um, uh, dynamics of how stories are passed along and who are the kind of hot spots of owning the narrative, if you will, and owning and shaping the narrative um, I just think of it as community management practices, um, really community organizing practices, um, but done with people who we mainly communicate with online. Um, I think it's different though than, I said community management, but I think it's different mm. than community management, like online community management. There's a bunch of practices around this, um, but I, I think grounding it in community organizing, um, figuring out what's important to the influencers, why they're motivated, what kind of change they want to see, um, yeah. and really engaging them deeply in the process, I think is important. And do you see any trends or patterns in the organizations that are doing that well? I mean, I'm wondering specifically, I guess, if, you know, if the organizations that are good at organizing and get the values and fundamentals of organizing and building people up and transformational leadership and empowering people, 
are those who, you know, who would also be good at this online. Mm. That's a really, I think I don't have a lot of visibility into that, honestly. Yeah. Um, there's probably a lot of it going on that you just can't really see. Don't see, sure. Uh, and little tiny things like just thanking people for retweeting, like that's influencer community management. Sure. Um, but that's not always visible in a, in a kind of yeah. in-depth way. Um, the places where it is a little bit more visible to us um, is when we're figuring out, uh, we've done some research work on, on identifying influencers. Um, and when we're doing that influencer research process, we can see more of who's doing a good job connecting with each other. Right. Um, I think it's always neat to see that it's not always, um, I think a lot of influencer relationship building and um, organizing <clears throat> happens not out of the top, like not out of the at Greenpeace or at Greenpeace USA mm -hmm. Twitter, um, but out of individual accounts that may or may not be like official staff accounts. Right. Um, it's a lot of very human to human kind of stuff. So it's kind of hard to see sometimes. People still connect and relate to humans rather than... It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. It is a funny time. I wonder, you know, if you, I imagine that if you walk into any fundraising director's office, almost any organization, they could give you a list of their top 25 donors, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know if you could do the same with every digital engagement director, right? Would they, you know, hopefully more than half would be able to say, yeah, here are our main online influencers who are, uh, driving our story and helping move our campaigns around and engaging others at magnitudes greater than we are ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I, I bet it's, it's, I think it still seems like a bit of a frontier, mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that there's, it's data that is accessible in the same way that there's data accessible on your donors. Yep. Um, and I bet most, um, most social media managers or most people who are sitting at those accounts do know um, sure. So in some ways, there's a, just a big atten attention gap between where the practice happens um, and at the top where resources are being right. allocated. And I think just hooking up that information um, in the hierarchy that exists in organizations can be really powerful mm -hmm. um, and cool. can help um, d have more people powered campaigns. And so one more question on this. Do you, do you think, you know, when you study how do... How, you know, you've been in the business of driving narratives, right, when trying to figure out how do you impact them and change them. Do you think that, or would you say that it's, it is ultimately the influencer, it's not masses of people doing it, but that at the core it's, um, it's these, these influencers or these certain types of individuals that are most critical? Um, the reason why I have the emphasis on individuals is because of their, obviously they're sitting in seats that have um, powerful distribution channels, um, and that's a part of it. Um, but why those distribution channels are attractive is that those influencers are usually really good curators, and they know mm -hmm. what's going to resonate with their individual audiences. And finding yep. those, um, when you can tap into networks right into the spot of like the people who have mastered resonance, within their, um, I, in my mind, there's like circles and circles and circles, <laughs> a network of circles being drawn out. Um, those people are basically rich, influencers are basically rich in resonance. Um, so it's not that they're controlling the conversation, it's that they're good at tapping into the places that inspire and motivate and get more people to share um, and more people to understand mm -hmm. and relate to that narrative. Um, so I think that's the powerful thing is that influencers are, are taking and curating and customizing um, and really making sense of the issue for mm -hmm. their discrete audiences. And mm -hmm. that's the thing that I think is just powerful. Well, I know we have to go in a minute here. I'm just curious, are there any, um, any plans for what's next for you or for, for Team Upwell at this point that you can share? Sure thing. Um, I've been running a startup for three and a half years and I am very ready um, to take a step back um, and do a bunch of digesting. I can't, I am terrible at articulating how much I have learned in this, um, but You're pretty I've good so far. <laughs> definitely changed uh, a lot of the ways that I work and I think about doing this work. Mm. So um, I have some, some digesting to do. And then um, the great thing about um, the visibility and the openness in the way that we've been able to work with Upwell, that there's info there's interest from a ton of other movements. Um, we're having conversations in health and wellness and in mm -hmm. U.S. democracy and 
um, in the achievement gap, a bunch of different kinds of things. Um, so there, there may be research projects that go forward. Um, and my, my big hope and dream is that we'll be able to um, gain some of those efficiencies of scale by having centralized um, analytics teams who can help support movements um, and really get that um, responsive campaigning, minimum viable campaigning, um, influencer community management um, kind of stuff, influencer community organizing uh, practices out into these movements uh, with yeah. trainings and support. So my big vision is that there could be upwells for lots of things. Well, I certainly think you've cleared a path for many of us to follow and hopefully for funders to start investing more and more in. But it's been an incredible learning experience, I know, for all of us at Greenpeace to um, learn directly from you uh, as well as indirectly. And I'm hoping that also this conversation is useful to others who are trying to keep alive a lot of the practices and things that, you've, that you and your team have, have been able to surface over the past almost, almost four years. So... So thank you for the debrief. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, thank you, Mob Lab, for bringing together um, a community of practitioners. Um, this is kind of weird and scary work sometimes. And it's been really great to know that there are people all over the world um, at lots of different organizations yeah. doing this kind of work um, that we can have hard conversations with and really learn from. So thanks for convening us all. More it of helps. This. Thank you.